You're listening to a podcast of The Mojo with Steph Renee. Weekdays, 10 a.m. till noon on 900 a.m. WURD.com. Today's program, but it is time for Real Black Radio and Mike D is in the house. Good morning, sir. Hey, Steph. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Great. Great. Yeah. Um, just coming off a big week now. I, I, I've been so busy. I didn't get a chance to watch The Roots. I, I've series. been DVRing it. I haven't seen any of it. So, um, you know, happy to take any Go calls late, d- during the little break to um, to find out how, what people thought of it, but uh, we'll probably talk about it maybe next week. Okay. All right. But... Um, you know, uh, but it did. But I should. I am happy to report that it, it's the most viewed um, opening min- night for the miniseries uh, in three years for any miniseries on cable. Excellent. To clarify, it got uh, 5.3 million viewers on the History Channel and an additional three million viewers. Why are you holding it? Oh, it's that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> She's checking the mic. <laughs> An additional 3 million viewers. So 8.5 million viewers watched the opening episode of uh, Roots despite the boycott. So, okay. So just wanted to get that out of the way. Well, I mean, d- despite the boycott, are we saying that we actually think that uh, that uh, Snoop Dogg was successful in inspiring a boycott? Because I don't think he was. Well, you know, Snoop responsible for, for Soul Plane. Snoop responsible for all the... Uh, the uh, Snoop Dogg's doggy style porn videos back in the early nineties. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, but that's what I mean. That that you know, you said despite the boycott, I'm like Snoop voiced his opinion and got resoundingly <laughs> batted down by a bunch of other reputable voices in in media and entertainment. But you know, I mean, I think that there is uh, something to be said for this idea that um, you know everybody has an opinion. Uh-huh. That doesn't mean it's a respected opinion, and that doesn't mean that it's going to influence, uh, you know, vast amounts of people but, but who were, have a different kind of relationship the, with this material. Well, there were a lot of people, including Charles Woods, who called in last week, who yeah. just stated their their frustration or their their, their exhaustion with seeing slave narratives over and over and said they weren't going to tune in. Right. So not necessarily a boycott, but look, I'm, I'm tired of seeing this kind of image of ourselves. I don't want right. to watch this. Right. And, and you know, I mean, I, there's been a lot of conversation uh, mm-hmm. on social media mm-hmm. about the idea of telling our stories. So hopefully what, what I'm hoping that at least the conversation will stimulate is if you're not necessarily in support of the idea of a remake of the Roots miniseries, then uh, a more conscious effort producing, producing mm-hmm. and or consuming a vast, uh, you know, bouquet mm-hmm. of images about black people from all walks of life, either retelling our true stories or providing a positive narrative of who we are or the complexities of who we are right. within the way that we're consuming media, especially as we enter into this summer blockbuster season where people are getting out more to go to the movies or in more watching right. more TV or whatever that, you know, that we're just consciously well it's you know. it's really important for us to know our history yes you know which leads us into our our first guest for the show um who is the subject of of really this is a, a piece of history that i didn't even know about you mm-hmm. know until until i guess espn and spike lee's little joints decided to, to make to tell the story uh so with us on the line is lincoln phillips who was the coach of the uh uh championship a soccer team at Howard University back in the early 70s. Yes, indeed. Good morning, Mr. Phillips, and welcome to WURD. Good morning. Good morning. It's indeed a pleasure to be on your show. Um, I feel very honored. Yes. Well, I mean, I, I'm really honored because, I mean, this is something I, I I didn't know. I mean, I don't I don't want to spoil it. I mean, I, I want you to tell folks, what is what is Redemption Song about? This movie that's, that premieres digitally on June 7th and then airs next Friday on ESPN as part of the undefe- undefeated TV show. Well, well you know, the, it's, it's a great title. It, 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 the last time I looked in the dictionary, Redemption is when, when, when uh, somebody... Uh, uh, when, when you have something of value and uh, somebody just swoops up and, and takes it away and you, you know, you must have all your, your energy and you take it back. And uh, that's exactly what had happened. Um, I uh, came in uh, to Howard University and um, in 1970 as assistant coach and the, the, my first year in 1971, we won the 
the NCAA championship. And at that time, there was only one division. And um, uh, our players came from Africa and, and the Caribbean. And uh, we just shot, shot the, the, the soccer world. And um, uh, this title, obviously, was taken away from us for dubious reasons. And um, uh, it was uh, vacated. And um, in 1973, we were placed on probation. And in 1974, behind the slogan, Truth Crushed the Earth Shall Rise Again, we won every single game. Wow. Untied, undefeated. That is still a record that's standing in NCAA soccer as we speak. Well, I was going to say, when I saw your name, Lincoln Phillips, I assumed that you were of Caribbean heritage and I can hear the accent. So where where have you brought all of these coaching skills and I imagine uh, playing skills at some point in your life as well from what what island are, are your descendants from? Oh, uh, yeah. Tr- Trinidad and Tobago. Aha. Yeah, Trinidad and Tobago, we, uh, in the Caribbean uh, and Africa, uh, uh, we, we have a, a rich heritage of soccer. Yes. And um, I came to the United States. I was representing my national team in the Pan American Games in 1967. And little Trinidad and Tobago shot the world and, be- and beat Argentina, which is a soccer power, mm-hmm. and Colombia. And we ended up winning the, the, the bronze medal. And professional soccer was just getting started here uh, in the United States in the 70s, uh, the North American Soccer League, and many uh, Caribbean and African and, and, and uh, South American players were recruited to start up these teams. So I came in, and that's where I got my soccer skills and, and coaching skills, and uh, I, I ended up here in Washington, right in the uh, arms of Howard University in 1970. Yes. Mm. Now, now, it's, now to clarify, so the 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 title was vacated for curious reasons. Like this, you you shook the world up in 1971. Like I, yes. I, I guess you got, guys, nobody expected Howard University or any black school to beat all of the teams. Exactly. So, so politically, there were some things behind the scenes that they said there's some ineligible players. Is that was that the well, excuse? They, they, uh, the, the, the rules, the NCAA rules, especially at that time, were so vague. And um, the, one of them, you know, was uh, the SAT violation of the SAT rule. Now, the SAT was a test set up to, to, to decide, you know, what level of, of the students should be placed at. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, Howard University... For over a half century, over a century, have been de- has been dealing with Caribbean and, and African students, and in, in in the Caribbean, at the end of your high school year, you take an exam which is called the General Certificate of Education, similar mm-hmm. to the SAT. Okay. And uh, you take about you take about five five courses, five or eight courses. And it's graded on an A, B, and C level. Now, if you get five passes, you know, on the A, B, or C, that means you're eligible to go to any university in the United States. Now, if you get all A's in in any of them, then you move on two more years uh, at high school and you take what you call an advanced level. Now, when you do an advanced level, those are your doctors and your lawyers. These are Mm. exceptional students. And Howard University, they know that whenever they receive a a student from the Caribbean with an A level, they don't need to do the SAT to satisfy them. They eventually give them about 20 or 30 advanced credits. Okay. And uh, so our argument, you know, when, we, when this was taken to court, was that we did not um, uh, uh, exclude our students, uh, the, these soccer players, from doing an SAT, SAT test. Uh, we just knew, and we have been doing that, you know, for the longest while, not to form a soccer team, but this has been our custom. And... Um, 
that was upheld, and um, and eventually, the following year, the the the, the, the NCAA, uh, the courts made them change it. Oh, no. okay. So, so rules it was changed. Until then, and after that, it was it was it was not good anymore. It didn't apply hmm. to the, to the Caribbean students, you know. Right. Well, you know, hearing you explain the sort of intricacies about how uh, this ruling was applied is very interesting to me because, of course, the SAT is developed and administrated uh, outside of the U.S. collegiate, uh, you know, system. And so to make it a requirement that you would have to take this test that is not in any way officially, uh, you know, fully accredited by the colleges themselves is it you know that sounds like the fix is in yeah yeah it um but you know the the, the laws have changed now and and there's the, the folks are now uh there's a clearing house and you have to go through before you enter university so all these things uh it, it, it won't happen again, really. Right. You know, right. So, because you no, know, you have you have a watchdog there, and uh, I think that's good. But it was it was it was very very sad, you know, because we we went out there, we worked hard, we won our championship, and um, they took it away from us, and um, and uh, we our whole attention was never ever about racism or anything like that. Oh, no. Our whole thought uh, was to come back and win it. Yeah. And I believe I was able as a coach to keep our players uh, focused on winning it back. And and that's what we did. And I was very proud of my players that we did that. Right. And, and um, also, I understand you have a book out, an autobiography? Yes. I, um the autobiography uh, it's, it's entitled "Rising Above and Beyond the Crossbar." Hmm. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, the, the, the uh, a lot of the uh, book was written obviously about Howard University, and the authors Mark Wright and uh, not authors I'm sorry producers Mark Wright and Kenan Holly. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mark in particular read the book. And uh, was amazed. Uh, he liked it very much. He liked the journey, and especially my tenure journey at Howard University. And that's where he got the idea uh, to approach ESPN and do a story on the the, the Howard University soccer program. Nice. Right. Yeah. No. Spike Lee's little joints are great. I don't know if you've seen them online or on when they show up on ESPN. No, but I'll be looking for them now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the, they they kick off the season kicks off tonight. Um, on uh, on the undefeated, which is, uh, uh, but it's also the first movie is Two Fists Up, which is directed by Spike Lee, and that's online. So if you go to ESPN, you can find these movies. They'll be released every week for the next month. Beautiful. Well, Coach Phillips, I have a question. I'm wondering, you know, with your success with uh, this program at Howard, and as we have watched uh, the love for, and I like calling it football because it's the original football before yeah. you know Americans called another game that um what your thoughts are about the role that hbcus could or probably should play in developing more black talent to be out there you know and 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 really develop more uh you know world-class soccer players because you would think that with the uh legacy that we have in being able to reach into black communities and develop black scholars and what have you that we would also uh be able to take this uh, you know universally uh, played game it throughout the African diaspora and develop more uh, world class talent to be able to play professionally all around the world oh, oh yeah I, I'm, I'm so happy that you mentioned that um, you know right now uh, I've just done a, a survey uh, there are over 105 uh, um, age reviews in the country and out of them, um, only about 32 of them have soccer programs, okay? Yeah. And out of those 32, just about, um, that means we have about 60 coaches uh, in all. Out of all that total, only about 10 of them are, 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 are black, uh, black, um, black coaches. Wow. You see? 
and uh, so uh, the rest of them, they, 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 they bring in coaches. Uh, obviously, they are not a whole lot of American uh, black coaches, you know, in the HBUs. So what they look to in, uh, towards Europeans and South Americans to coach their programs, and this is this is this is so sad because I I, I when I looked it up, I, I was I was shocked, and I'm hoping that. Um, that we that we push this film to the point where we start getting more and more um, uh, uh, black coaches being hired by our black institutions, and and here it is many many of the programs, most of them the, the players are white players. Hmm. Yes, from Europe, they, they obviously the coaches bring these players over just like I did with my Caribbean players. Right, but now they they for for for. The folks in Europe, the, the a black education now is good, <laughs> you know. And so why, so why are, are we not able to to bring in more of our black students in and around the the the, the, pro, the programs? Right. We have all over the country now. We have a lot of inner inner city programs cropping up. Why can't we start? really going into these areas and actively recruiting. We have to do that. We can't leave it to anybody else to do. We have to, we have to focus on doing that. And um, I had founded about 20 years ago a Black Coaches Association. And, um, and uh, that is one of the things that we are fighting very, very hard to do is to recruit players in the inner city programs. Yes. Wow. Well, you know, again, Coach, congratulations yes. on having this story told. I'm really looking forward to seeing the film and, and reading your book. And, you know, as a D.C. native, I also have a, a particular uh, soft spot in my heart for Howard University. So I'm glad, I'm sad that I'm just learning this history, mm-hmm. but glad that the right uh, stars have aligned and uh, resources have come together in order to make sure that more of us learn about this important story. Story. Yeah. So uh, again, the movie's called Redemption Song. Uh, mm-hmm. We're talking with Lincoln Phillips, and the digital release is June seventh, and then um, it's going to be screened on Friday Night Movie Night uh, June tenth, next Friday, as yeah. part of the Undefeated yeah. Show. Uh, executive producer Spike Lee, director Kenan Holly, and producer Mark Wright. Yes, indeed. I, again, uh, let's put these uh, push it as much as possible because. We just want to change the narrative. We want to, to 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 make sure that we have all the opportunities outside there for scholarships and professional uh, uh, play. Uh, we want that. We want to be a, a better balance to come about. You know, we want our black folks to enjoy a piece of the American pie. So, so try let's try to get it outside there and everybody tune in, especially on the tenth for the redemption song. And I I thank you very much for having me on your program, Shanana. Indeed. Thank you so much, Coach Phillips. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to take our next commercial break. We are going to continue this idea of our true stories, our history, bridging gaps across spaces and reuniting us with history. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify, Friday night movie night is part of the 6 p.m. hour of Sports Center on ESPN. Ah, okay. So it will air then and then later in the evening. Uh, no, then you can watch it digitally. You can okay. watch it online. Okay, so we'll make sure that we you have all that information straight as we return with more Real Black Radio here on The Mojo on 900 AM WURD in just a moment. This song is called, I don't know, maybe it'll be called Give It Up because that's like the, um, the um, chorus.
gentlemen, is a little taste of the music and the global collaborative effort that has led to the development of an artist named Princess Shaw. She's going to be joining us on the line momentarily, but we'll make sure that we post a link Mm -hmm. to uh, this video so that people can understand that this wasn't something that just kind of sprouted up in a a standard recording session. This was something that began with an acapella vocal Mm -hmm. that a producer halfway around the world uh, you know kind of took on and then farmed out to other people to collaborate and create the final project or the final uh, um, um, piece that we're hearing as the soundtrack of this video but in the video you get a chance ladies and gentlemen to see all of the people who are playing uh, upright bass and piano and drums and horns that Mm -hmm. contribute to this soundscape and I think you know for folks that aren't on social media that aren't you know really familiar with how all of this works in the modern era Mm -hmm. the idea of a collaborative process like this is, is a little foreign But I even have recorded music uh, with a producer that I've never met in real life. Wow. Uh, You know, uh, Peter Major, otherwise known as Opalopo, he lives in Sweden. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we, you know, we know plenty of people uh, collaboratively in the uh, in the music industry and specifically with house music. And he heard one of my songs that he really loved. I heard some of his remixes that I loved. We started collaborating or speaking to one another uh, via email. And he had a track that he had originally used as a remix for Marvin Gaye's Sexual Healing. Right. And he was like, he, and he, I didn't know that when he first sent it to me. He was just like, what do you think about the track? I was like, I love the track. He's like, write to it. <laughs> and, you know, so back and forth, I recorded, you know, uh, a bunch of vocal tracks here in Philadelphia and sent them to him to mix down. And I got the final product of what he had produced while I was in Singapore. Wow. Uh, and then it got picked up for his album that was released on a Japanese label. So truly, you know, uh, an international collaborative effort wow. uh, in terms terms of creating one of my favorite songs that I've written over the years. And so, you know, it's just it's great to know that other people um, have benefited from that kind of electronic exchange. Right. No. And and just via YouTube, somebody, a producer in Israel, in this case, Kutaman, he 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 looks at the videos like so Princess lives in New Orleans. Yes. And she she's just a a struggling artist and she's making she's making the music and posting it to her YouTube page. Right. Which only at at that time only had a couple hundred followers or fans, you know, and you only need one person to see what you're doing. And then he he transformed that and then he took clips like the little piano sample is that of like a little five year old girl girl. and different people playing oboes and things and just orchestrated it um, through samples and and uh, well not not to spoil anything we were hoping that she'll call but uh, you know internet fame leads to a tour right and also performance at the Guggenheim so yeah. and this is all in the new movie presenting Princess Shaw which opens today at the Ritz Bourse and you can also get it on iTunes if, if you're not anywhere near the Ritz Theater you can watch it on iTunes or on demand so right well let's give out the phone numbers as we're waiting for her to call in and you know kind of add to this conversation because the universality of soulfulness, the universality of black music and its appeal to people around the world isn't anything that surprises people in our regular listening audience. We know that. But uh, in addition to uh, this subject, you know, we asked those people who've been watching Roots, who have very strong opinions about Roots, the original or the remake, Mm -hmm. are encouraged to call in as well. 215-634-8065. Toll free at 1-866-361-0900. You can also tweet me at WURD underscore S Renee. Tweet Mike at Real Black, R E E L B L A C K. And, um, you know, even groups like the Foreign Exchange, mm-hmm. who I love. The reason why they have their name is because at the time they got together, they were, you know, uh, Fonte as the MC and Nicolay as mm-hmm. the producer were frequent flyers on the okplayer.com uh, bulletin boards that okay. you know that's how the website started with people kind of exchanging information and Fonte really liked 
uh, Nicolay's production. They st- they started emailing back and forth. Same thing. Nicolay sends him a track. Fonte records on it, sends it back. Right. And then next thing you know, now Nicolay has moved to North Carolina where Fonte was based, found himself a wife <laughs> and, you know, built a life around this concept of, um, you know, a- a- around this concept of recognizing something special in each other's talents Mm -hmm. and building a whole career around uh, building on that similarity Mm -hmm. regardless of you know uh, and same thing uh, uh, Nicolay Scandinavian so there's something to be said I think (laughs) for for that for that part of the world Norway and Sweden uh, uh, Amsterdam you know like Mm -hmm. in, in that space the Netherlands you know there's so much interest in soulful music and how um, and how people are, you know, whether they're singing over it or rhyming over it, how to be able to build these layered, beautiful Mm -hmm. uh, sounds that appeal around the world. Definitely, definitely. So. And so to contribute to that conversation, we have Kenny calling in from North Philly. Good morning. Good morning, Steph. How are you? I'm okay. I just want to, uh, you you mentioned um, Paul for now. Mm-hmm. You're the only person I ever heard talking about them. Well, you know, I think I don't think the CDs in print anymore. And like I said, David Ryan Harris is one of my favorites of all time. So the first time I ever heard them, I uh, immediately fell in love with their sound. And they went on to work with uh, Dion Ferris, who's another huge, uh, you know, influence in 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 my rock side of things. Uh, so you know that that's how that's how it blossoms. They were young and they were bad. I went to see them at um it was hardcore school ed fall for now in 24 7 spot really now that and was a that, hell of a show i'm uh, sorry i missed that <laughs> it was bad but anyway i was helping this woman clean her apartment right she gave me money like bag of money to turn it into cash uh-huh. and she gave me her keys and when i came walked in the door i said honey i'm home <laughs> <laughs> did you hear that song? yes holy yes <laughs> holy moses and yes day i went out and bought that i didn't have the cd but i went out and bought that the next day and then i heard that i'm that's synchronicity Yes, it right. definitely is. Because that is one of the baddest on Holy Moses. It is. Yeah, you know, but you ain't hear twenty four seven spies yet, did you? Yeah, well, no, I, like I say, I've heard twenty four seven spies. They're just not a group that I've had in my collection. I need to go back and just grab, you know, grab some of that and so sit with bad. it for a minute. Yeah. You gotta get um, harder than you and strength in numbers. Okay. Wow. I got Gumbo Millennium. Heavy metal soul by the pound, temporarily disconnected. Yeah, and, and Gumbo Millennium is the is the album cover that I have, you know, kind of permanently burned in my brain because when I was working my part time job mm-hmm. in the music store while I was okay. in college, that was the one we used to run in the store. That album. I'm here here to tell stories. Stories that don't contain the glory. It's the history of the visible me. The fact that they have color, I should be. I'm not sure why they make a difference. Something to do with something. <laughs> 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 trying to tell me what color is all about. You, you, you got Kenny started this I know, morning. Listen, listen, I appreciate it, though, because Black Rock is, is sort of, you know, Kenny's bailiwick. So I appreciate the fact that we've activated that well, on today's program. Well, 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 before we take our break, I, I did want to mention, uh, shout out to Daryl DeBress. He's hosting a show this Sunday night. Frank McComb is back in town. Nice. Uh, for an intimate one night only event, $25 at Ruben Mar- Ruben's Mark at uh, Stanton Avenue and Mount Pleasant. The information is on my website, on Facebook, and it's you know he's always a great show. If you love Stevie Wonder, Donny Hathaway, this guy, That's there's right. no one better. And he's performed with Prince. Yes. So I'm sure he'll have some Prince stories to tell. Indeed, and we let you know we we are big fans of Frank here on uh, on WURD as well. So let's go ahead and take our uh, commercial break, and when we come back, Princess Shaw is on the line, and we Yay. get a chance to talk a little bit more in depth about this concept of international soulful collaborations and the positive possibilities of that when people really really honor the gift and we'll do that as we continue on real black radio in just a moment from my good folks part of the reason why the black rock coalition Mm -hmm. was formed the family stand is the name of the group and that is the title track from their album moon in scorpio and uh, you know shout out to sandra st victor is is one of my peoples uh and you know the uh way that they have been able to remind us that 
the rock is such an essential element of our black history because they never walked away from their blackness and their mm-hmm. lyrics and the way that they presented themselves on stage. It was always a celebration of who we are and reminding people that we have a lot to say about that sound. Right. Absolutely. Well, you know, black black creativity is in all expressions. Yes. All expressions. We 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 we're, we're just the 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 life force of so much creativity, so much music. What what would this world be if we if if not for with, with if not for us? Right. And I really think I honestly, you know, some there obviously takes a lot of practice and refinement. Yeah. But sometimes you just have that natural gift and um and you know this this movie Princess Shaw, mm-hmm. you know definitely you know this this woman Samantha Montgomery has that gift. I, I don't know if well you, if well you part of that is movie. is about New Orleans. Okay. So, you know, so when you talk about you know people say what's in the water in Philadelphia that makes all these soulful folks, especially bassists, because we're very much known for the bass players that come out of this city in New Orleans. It's the same thing. So whether you're talking about Bayou Water, or whether you're talking about you know the lakes and the Gulf, okay. then there there's something to be said for the legacy that is seeped in the soil. Well, that well, helps to produce all with, these amazing with us, artists. With us on the line is Samantha Montgomery. AKA Princess Shaw. Now, welcome to the show. Would you agree with uh, Stephanie Renee's assessment? Well, hi, guys. Thanks for having me on. Hey, yes. Um, I am actually from Chicago. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I moved to New Orleans, and I think New Orleans had, had, it had an influence on me. It's, it's really like rich in heritage. And like you can, it's like mainly, I think it's the only place where you can walk up the street and literally hear like horns and jazz, people playing music softly. Like, that's the only place that I've, that I've, that I've, that I've noticed that that happens there. So. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of agree with you. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, well, Chicago has its own amazing history as far as the development of the blues and jazz as well. Yeah. So, you know. So, you but, know, you know I, I didn't really develop. I, I found my voice in, in New Orleans. Yeah. Mm. So that's why I kind of attribute that to that. And I found, you know, maybe it was me getting older or whatever, but I found my original voice in New Orleans. Yeah. And mm. I think it had a little influence on me because I would hear the, the, the music and the people and the way they are and it's just this rich culture and the way everybody you know the way they are down there it's just it's dope yes. wow and and this technology is YouTube I mean it's an amazing story Princess Shaw and I want everybody to go see it so Real Black is hosting a movie meetup Monday night at 7.30 at the Ritz Boards to go Excellent. see it and then talk about it yeah. but I mean how, how did this movie come about or did is it two separate things? A filmmaker would decide to make a film about you, and then Kudaman discovers you, or were they in cahoots? Or no, what happened was Kudaman found me first. I mean, he had chips, chips every so often. Where he okay. he did the first album. The first album he did was through you. Then he decided to through you too, and which is the second, the second one of the, of the you know the first one, the second one. So he was looking on. He had a musical arrangement already. His musical arrangement set up. He needed a vocalist. So he started to go through YouTube, and he happened to, he happened across me, and so he found the song "Give It Up." He put it in the music arrangement. Right? It just spit. He said, "Just it just spit with the music." Mm. He put it in there, and then him and the director are friends. So mm. the director saw me through him and decided, <clears throat> excuse me, guys, he wanted to do a documentary about YouTubers, and so he cut, he came from Israel, director from, but they both from Israel. His wife contacted me through Facebook and said he was doing it documentary about YouTube to like be involved. I'm like, sure, why not? Mm-hmm. He came down. He came down, you know, I was like thinking like <laughs> he I'm like, I'm not that interested, like, you know, <laughs> like, you know, why would anybody want to <laughs> film my life? You know what I'm saying? So he came down from um Israel, I met him in a lobby of his hotel and then um I felt like when I met him he's really a sweet, sweet, wonderful person. And I felt like I could be as open as I could with him because he, he has this thick accent who's like a really gentle soul and then now he followed me over mic and then he kept coming back but in the <laughs> beginning it was about YouTubers but mm-hmm. after a while the more he went to back home to Israel he said the more his heart wanted him to come back to New Orleans and film me so that's how I became the center of the documentary me and Cleveland <laughs> Wow. I mean, you know, just it just in and of itself, one of the things that, that that illustrates to us, A, is this idea that social media, a lot of people, you know, think about social media within the context of their world. So, you know, taking pictures of of their latest great 
plate of food that they made, you know, <laughs> at a concert that they went to. You know, even though it's it's a, a global phenomenon, people tend to make it very hyper local. And you're telling us about a story that helped you bridge thousands of miles with yeah. other creative souls that are now going to help elevate your own career. Which is dope. Yeah. It's dope. Yeah, how does it feel? You're, this movie's coming out, the you know, and getting amazing reviews, by the way. Yeah, yeah I, I just you know I take it as it, it comes. You know, I feel wonderful about it. I think it's a it's, it's like I think it happened right when it was supposed to happen. I think it was done beautifully. It was a beautiful documentary. Um, I feel overwhelmed, but completely humbled by this whole experience. And one thing I remain myself. I stay I stay grounded, mm-hmm. and I just you know I just go with it. But I feel so blessed by this whole thing. Yeah. yeah. No, no, you never get more than you can hold, you know. Uh, yeah. You know, so, but I, I think, I think things are just about to explode. I mean, that, that song, Give It Up, it just, it just stays, it just stays with you. I was going to say, and we played Give It Up uh, coming out of our last commercial break. So we've had, people have had a chance to hear your music here on, on the cool. station in conjunction with this story. And so, you know, you moved to New Orleans post Katrina. So I wonder if you also think about, you know, this whole idea of I tell people and I intend to retire to New Orleans, just so you know, um, (laughs) that one of the things that attracts me uh, Uh to New Orleans is this idea of spiritual energy that to me, walking through the streets, whether I'm hearing music or not, I feel the presence of the history in that yeah. space. And to me, it seems yeah. even more pronounced post Katrina because I think, you know, that that storm rustled up a lot of that energy that may not have been as present for people as it was for me every time I, I've been there. But do you think that maybe in this reconstruction era of what New Orleans is growing into, that some of that spiritual uh, essence has been sort of guiding this process for you, your career and what's been happening with this film? Yeah, I think so. You know, I think like people say in New Orleans, people that are from born and raised there, they say that it was better, like it was different before Hurricane Katrina. They say it's different now. It was like better then, but I feel like you know I don't really know how it was before, but I just feel like it's a. It, it, I understand what you're you can feel that the energy. It's like an energy there, like this wonderful energy that's in, all around you in the air. It's a place to me like Louisiana, like New Orleans, no other place. You know, so yeah, yeah. Well, paint a picture for me again. Um, so you just, out of your heart, you just started posting videos, starting a blog. Um, well, it started because I think I have a lot of songs in my head and my heart. So I was in 2012. I started my my YouTube um, my YouTube channel. That's after when I discovered my voice. I started the channel, and so I just started. You know, I wanted to find somebody who could play musical arrangements behind my my songs because I can't play instruments. And that's how it started. And so from that point, it became sort of a confessional, a way to empty my soul, purging my spirit of, you know, all this vow, all these demons that were per- that were chasing me down. It just, But I didn't think beyond my phone when I started to do the talking like about my personal life. It was just me and my phone at that time, so I didn't really think beyond it. And I just mm-hmm. pushed publish, like just a normal thing to do. It was just a way to get it out of me. So I didn't really, I didn't think too much about the outcome of what it would be you know i just i did it on a whim yeah mm-hmm. and you know and just to, to, for a small group of people really but but yeah, I, I, like i was saying before all you need is like one person to see yeah, I mean, and you know it was but it was like it wasn't my challenge wasn't really it was just man i wasn't doing it to get like fame and fortune i was just doing it to get basically to get somebody to help me with some music so i can go to the studio and record my songs, but I want original music for my original songs. Mm. And so that was my main focus because it was all about the music and it still is for me. It's all about the music and my songs and singing. I love it. So that was the main focus. Well, and that's the thing when you see the movie, this is, uh, Samantha, you are a true artist, you know, well, thank you. And, um, and the moment, the moment when it just hits, I guess everybody has that moment where, you know, that spark gets lit. Yeah. You know, it's captured on, on the, in the film. You know, when you the first time you hear the song or or whatever. Oh, thank you. The the Rock finished song. the finished version of the song. 
rock stars. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are certainly thankful that you were able to join us on the air today to kind of, you know, outline for people what this journey has been like for you. Yeah. And, and maybe we'll get a chance to circle back around to you as this uh, movie begins playing in theaters and people get a chance to really take in your journey visually and see, yeah. you know, what this process has been like for you to continue catching up with mm-hmm. you and see what's going to be developing as people see this and as more people become familiar with your music. Yeah, and you know, the thing is I'm working on I'm work I'm working on my first official album with Cootie Man. He's producing the whole thing. So I'm excited about that. I can't wait to like, you know, for people to hear the music. You know, I can't wait. I'm excited about it. So. Well we want our listeners to be the first to hear it. So how can people follow you? Okay, so you can follow me on Instagram underscore princess underscore Shaw. You can follow me on Facebook, Prince to Shaw. I do live videos on my personal page, which is I am Destiny Montgomery. I A M B E S T I N Y Montgomery. And then there is um, YouTube, Prince to Shaw. I have a SoundCloud page, which is a freestyle SoundCloud page. Me and the music is Princess Shaw 37. Two separate words Princess Shaw 37. And Rock Sauce. And thank you guys for having me. Okay. Absolutely. Well, last last thing. So I know you're working with Kuderman, but yeah. now Philly's full of producers as well. Can they can they hook up with your freestyles that you've already posted? Oh, um, you know, I'm I'm open to a lot of people. Like, you know, I'm open to it. I'm always open to to work with people. People that um, I think you need to work with people that fit you better. Mm-hmm. I just want to work with any person because some music doesn't fit me, but I'm willing to like you know to rock with a lot of people like I'm open to everybody Philly whoever whatever come on down (laughs) let's get it it, baby (laughs) well thank you I know it's early where you are but thank you so much thank you guys for having me absolutely I have a great day you too yeah, so yeah, I was really going to say, so yeah, uh, yeah it's, and it was so funny that she said it like that, mm-hmm. because I don't know what prompted that out of me mm-hmm. yesterday. I was walking someplace and I was like, you got it, baby. <laughs> and just, you know, the, New Orleans gets in you, man. I'm okay. telling you, it is a it is a very, very special place. <laughs> and so uh, so I'm, I'm glad that we've had that connection uh, and very much look forward to seeing the film and seeing how this star continues to rise uh, with this international collaboration she's developed definitely yeah well go you know people should go sit in the theater because that's the best way to see anything yes but if they can't make it to the theater if it's not playing where you are it's everywhere you can even watch on youtube for Mm 6.99 so they've they're they're definitely using uh all the on-demand stuff you can watch it on demand on your cable systems itunes all that amazon you know and and it's worth supporting but give us the meetup information again because i know there are people in the listening audience that want to come so this this monday night at the ritz at the Bourse, which is on fourth street at fourth and ranstead between chestnut and market um we're going to be doing a group meet meeting to go see support the film 7 30 p.m show monday ritz at the Bourse, presenting princess shaw and all this information is on realblack.com all that information is on the website and um also this sunday uh, once again frank mccomb is at uh, rubens mark it's not an official meetup but i'll be there Mm -hmm. uh daryl be there hopefully you guys can come Yes. So. Nice. Well, listen, we're all about spreading the culture as we slide into summer vacation season. Yes, we indeed. want people to extend themselves beyond their couch <laughs> and to come out and experience live music, experience the fellowship of groups gathering to go uh, check out this stuff in real time. And uh, another great show, sir. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you again. It went by fast. We had some great guests. It did. One more time. Also, can you run down the information on on Lincoln Phillips film. Oh, Lincoln Phillips film, Redemption Song. It um, premieres on the 7th online. online. Mm-hmm. And then next Friday night, during the 6 p.m. hour of Sports Center, for part of the Friday night at the movies segment, okay. it's going to screen. So uh, we, we can mention it again next week. But yeah, but yeah, Redemption Song. Yeah, great guest, Lincoln Phillips, Precious Shaw. Beautiful. And with that, we look forward to gathering together with Mike again next Friday for more Real Black Radio here on 900 AM WURD. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to keep it on the cultural tip as we are joined by Vinks on phone with more information about live performances here in Philadelphia. You've been listening to a podcast of The Mojo with Steph Renee. Weekdays, 10 a.m. till noon. Follow us on your favorite social media like Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter for up-to-the-minute information at 900 AM WURD.